once every few years a show comes along that is groundbreaking, that is thought-provoking, that is compelling, that has a great story but also makes you feel and care about these characters. So I think Prison Break, you know, is one of those shows that audiences are eager to see, are gonna, you know, get something out of it. It's, it's, it's the thinking man's TV show. The idea for Prison Break came from a, a woman I was working with at the time, a woman named Francis Kelly, and she thought it would be great for a guy to put himself into prison to start a prison break, which I thought was a very intriguing idea. But at the same time, I thought it was probably the single stupidest thing that a human being could do. I got involved with Prison Break because Gail Berman over at Fox called me and said, I have a script. You have to read this. I want you to do it. And I was like, okay. I mean, rarely do I get calls for TV shows. And I picked it up. I started to read it, and I cannot put it down. So I had to answer myself two questions in order to kind of go forward with this with this storyline. The first of which is, there could be no other way that this guy could do this, right? So the stakes had to be so high, and there could be no other recourse. That's where the idea for the for the condemned brother came from. And I read it. I called her up. I said, I love this, but I don't know where it's going to go. She goes, I got to sit you down with Paul Schering, who created the show, who has the the next five seasons mapped out already. And then the second thing was the protagonist had to be convinced he could pull this off. And that's where the idea came from, that this guy had access to the blueprints. And so kind of fulfilling those two uh, mandates, then at that point, you know, we just started filling out the storylines and just, uh, just populated this prison with a lot of different kind of interesting uh, characters. The material is what really got me to say, I want to do this show. I mean, uh, the characters, the relationship between the characters, there was heart. When you read the pilot, there was heart and you really cared about you know, what was gonna happen to these characters. So for me, it was the script that sucked me in and knowing that Paul really had a vision because a lot of pilots you shoot, for some people, they don't get picked up and it is a lot of hard work. And because Paul had it all mapped out and thought out, it just totally made sense for me to do it. And can you please tell me what's going through your head? We've been over that show. Well, for me, my approach was I wasn't shooting a TV show because I've never really done a TV show. I didn't really know how to do a TV show. I just knew how to tell a good story. And for me, it was really about I'm making a film here. I'm telling a story. I'm not worrying if it's TV, if it's film. My approach to it was to make it as cinematic as possible. Even though I'm making it for the small screen, I'm going to shoot it widescreen. I'm going to hire my crew from, from my feature films. You know, Dante Spinotti, who's my cinematographer. So, you know, my approach to it was I'm making a compelling story here. I'm not thinking about whether it's for television, whether it's for film, whether it's for, I'm gonna tell a great story. And I had the complete support of Paul who wanted to, you know, cast this in the right way. Um, even somebody who had a little tiny part, it was very important. It, it wasn't just about Wentworth and Dominic, you know, their, their characters. It was very important to really cast correctly each character because who knows where the characters were going to go and how they were going to develop and, and, and how much a part of the series they were going to become. We had to find somebody who could be a leading man, who we believe could come into a prison and carry, you know, carry himself in such a capacity that he wouldn't get killed. <laughs> when I was about to do Superman, a young actor by the name Wentworth Miller came in and auditioned for me and did a brilliant, brilliant job. I mean, it was amazing. And I never forgot him. And I told uh, Gail and, and Dana and everybody over at Fox, I said, you know, there's an actor that I auditioned for Superman who was brilliant that we have to see him. So we brought him in and he got the job. And then Wentworth came in about four or five days before we were going to shoot, and he was just manna from heaven because he was Schofield times one and a half. And he's brought so much to the role just by his own kind of integrity, his own kind of mystery, uh, just his presence in general. Uh, I play a character named Michael Schofield. I'm the younger of two brothers. I'm a structural engineer. My older brother is uh, in prison on death row, framed for the murder of the vice president's brother. In my attempts to free him, I've exhausted pretty much every legal angle and possibility to no avail. So um, I've decided to take matters into my own hands and rob a bank and get myself thrown into the same prison where he's being held and launch this very complicated uh, escape that uh, takes us through the first season of the show. You've seen the blueprints. Better than that. I've got them on me. Well, it's interesting, my perspective on who the character of Michael Schofield is has changed pretty significantly. When I first read the pilot and had no real inkling of where the story and the character was going to go, I thought that uh, he was an ordinary guy in extraordinary circumstances, that Michael was the good brother and his older brother Lincoln was the bad boy. But uh, as we've gone on, it's become pretty clear to me that Michael has just as many, if not more, issues 
uh, than the brother he's trying to save, because an ordinary person would never attempt what he's attempting to do. And what's been a lot of fun is to take Michael from where you first meet him, where he's uh, aloof, a bit shut down, cold, um, playing his cards very close to his chest, to the point uh, halfway into the season, uh, around episode 12, 13, where Lincoln actually gets sent to the chair, where all of that falls apart, and the fear and the anxiety and the uh, terror and anger that have been simmering below the surface this whole time that he's kept suppressed finally start to bust through, the cracks start to show. And uh, the last nine episodes of the first season are really about Michael trying to hold everything together, where really inside he's kind of coming apart at the seams. I have some similarities with the character of Michael Schofield. He's not me. Uh, I would never do what he's attempting to do. I certainly would never uh, secrete pills in my arm and then slice it open to get at them. But I think we do share certain qualities in common, like uh, a respect for discipline and uh, detail and uh, a certain perfectionist attitude toward our work. That's certainly how I approach uh, my work on set, and uh, it's how Michael approaches the execution of his plan. So Michael has various facets of me taken to an illogical extreme. I didn't kill that man, Michael. The evidence says you did. I don't care what the evidence says. I didn't kill him. I swear to you, Michael. With Dominic, for, for Lincoln, uh, that, was, that was equally as difficult to find because Lincoln was, you know, the sacred cow here, right? Which is, here's the, the, he has to be worth saving. Otherwise, this entire narrative, nobody cares because the guy is just a, a big galoot, right? <laughs> um, so there, there had to be kind of a, a duality in the character, which is, one, he had to have a heart of gold, but at the same time, uh, he had to be the shot caller in the prison. He had to be the biggest badass, and he had to convey both of these things. Dominic Purcell came in and stole that part. I mean, we had a, some fantastic actors coming in for Lincoln Burroughs, and he came in and just personified Lincoln Burroughs, his performance in the audition. He was that guy. Lincoln's a damaged, brooding soul. Before he got into prison, his life was destructive and out of control. There's a lot of wine, women, and song kind of life he existed in and dabbled in the you know, drugs and what have you, and uh, you know, eventually he um, got really deep and went to kill someone, really. He was set up, you know, the, the mob had threatened to kill his son if he didn't do this hit. So it wasn't like, you know, he went out there blatantly wanting to kill someone. I ain't killing no one. I must have missed the part where I gave you a choice. It's changed in that he has come to terms with execution. And that's made him um, very introspective and made him uh, want to achieve some kind of inner peace. He was on the way to doing that, and then uh, Michael busted in and threw that whole thing out the window. And as an actor, I had to deal with the, the sense of hope and also that part of it of resignation to death. So it was a two thing that I was trying to play. And at some point in the series, as an actor and as Lincoln, he had to believe that he was going to get out of the execution. The great thing about Lincoln is that you can see that he's redeemable and that there's hope for him and, uh, you know, he's not a totally lost cause kind of thing. Yes. What? what? You mean yes? Yes? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Fernando Zucre, he's a very passionate guy, a guy who, um, flies off the handle, he's just no control. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed, but he's just one of those guys you just learn to love. I mean, I've always thought of him uh, as one of those guys who fell through the cracks, wasn't raised well, hung out with the wrong crowd, but he, he's not a mean guy, he's not a murderer. He just, you know what, he just needed to survive in the streets. Actually, this is all I need. You know what, one of the things I loved about playing this character was He's not the typical thug. Uh, the, the way, the stereotype of Latinos in prison and he's a, a drug dealer or whatnot. This is a guy who fell through the cracks. So I was very motivated to play something different, bring something to the table, to a role that's been played many, many times, but I just wanted to bring something different, make him a little bit more uh, endearing. 
and basically that's my, that was my motivation just to really bring something else and just have layers for this guy that uh, uh, that we'll see even more through um, our com upcoming episodes. Why'd you hire him? Keep your friends close and your enemies close enough. Oh, I'm uh, Gianni Abruzzi. Johnny Abruzzi or oh, Johnny. He's sort of uh, not a typical Italian mobster. He's a mobster, but he's more a general mobster. He represents all the mobs in the world, you know, from the antique mobs all the way up to today. He is, uh, even if he has uh, an Italian name, he's really based upon the mob structure the family structure and more Shakespearean. Uh, he's more a Shakespearean avenger than a real mobster. Paul Sharing wanted in the beginning to get away from the, uh, hey, my friends, I'm Italian, I love pasta and pizza, let's come together, what you doing, you know? I'm gonna kill you, man. Hey, you come back to me, you know? I kill you as a friend. To get away from the whole mobster syndrome just to uh, use my own accent, being European, and uh, be more of a Shakespearean character than, you know, somebody from Al Capone, Chicago, and not try to copy anything else, just try to call him the mobster guy. And it can be, you know, he could be anybody from anywhere in the world, really. We got a hell of a lot to talk about, don't we? I uh, play the character C Note. He's basically at the beginning, he's the go to guy. He's the one that picked up the pug knack for Michael. And he's one of those guys, if you need anything, you go to him, he'll get it for you for $100. Hence the name C Note. In prison, he wears a mask, and is, you know, this tough, conniving hustler. But I think we finally get to realize, you know, what type of person he really is when he gets on the phone with his wife and his daughter. More sympathetic, more sensitive type of man, but he, you know, got himself caught up in a situation where he made a lot of bad decisions and now he's trying to correct him, but unfortunately he's correcting him in the wrong way. You know, he's he has his eyes on the prize and the prize is just like getting out. So whatever he has to do in order to, you know, get out, he's gonna he's gonna do that. But what motivates my character to get out of prison is my daughter and my wife. You know, my character knows that he has made D difficult decisions and decisions that have put him in prison, but he's trying to, you know, get to the point where he can take care of his family again. So his family is really motivating him to get out, you know, of uh, prison and getting back to, you know, square one, which I don't know how that's going to work out, you know what I mean? Because we're, we're working now and I'm thinking, okay, if he gets out of prison, first thing, you know, his wife doesn't know that he's in prison now, but the first thing that happens is, you know, we get knock on the door, wife opens it up, and you know, people are standing there like, where's your husband? Is he in here? And, you know, the fit is about to hit the shan, you know, as we say. So, uh, we'll, we'll see what, what's gonna happen. Name and back number. Schofield, Michael, 94941. You're a religious man, Schofield. Never really thought about it. Good, because the Ten Commandments don't mean a box of piss in here. We got two commandments and two only. The first commandment is you got nothing coming. What's the second commandment? See commandment number one. Bellick. He is a correctional officer, Bellick. He's in charge of taking care of the prisoners, you know, making sure they uh, do whatever the rules ask them to do. He takes them to lunch, you know, in a line. He takes them out into the yard in a line. He makes sure that they don't have any contraband on them or they're not, uh, you know, using drugs or making alcohol in their cells. Make sure that all of their illicit and illegal substances come through him because he's the one that makes all the money off of them. First of the month's coming up, John. Yeah, so I haven't got my monthly. He's one of the only people that has access to everyone. So he has access to the prisoners and the warden and the doctor and visitors when they come in. So he uh, plays everybody for what he needs them for. I think he has a lot of ambition. He wants to kind of have the warden's job. so trying to get that. I think he's a, a bit um, expedient in the sense that he will try to make things happen for him uh, depending on what the situation is. If he needs uh, to get something from the convict and he's got something the convict wants, he'll I'm sure trade one for the other. Uh, if the convict wants something from him, he'll say, well, what do you got for me? Can you help me here? Do you have any information for me? I think, you know, he's an uh, expert at playing 
people off of each other for his own end, his own, you know, satisfaction. I think he, uh, he's like anybody who has a big ego. I think they have uh, really low self-esteem. I think, you know, that bravado it covers up a pretty uh, wimpy, sad guy. You probably heard stories about me. They're not all true. Teabag is one of the rulers in the prison. When you walk into Joliet Prison the first day I got there, it was like, it looked so much like a castle. So it totally fed me for saying, yeah, yeah, this guy owns a part of this castle. He's one of the feudal lords, you know? And uh, he protects himself, he protects his family, he protects, early on in the production, one guy who holds my pocket. Anybody who messes with that guy has got to mess with me, and everybody knows who Teabag is, and you don't mess with him. Trap, I think I'm gonna slaughter. I have always tried to play him in a real charming way. The lascivious stuff, the dastardly stuff, that all sort of takes care of itself. He's an animalistic, pure, gutsy, instinctual kind of guy who will do anything to, uh, to get ahead. He's an equal opportunity abuser. <laughs> he goes after every race and creed. When people talk about him in sexual terms, I, I don't even think of male, female, child, whatever. To me, it's just like, it's meat, and I want it, and I'm, uh, if I'm hungry, I go for it, and if not, I don't. It's like a, a, a lion, and a lot of the psychological gestures that I put into it with the hair and the, and the tongue thing is all just cock of the walk rooster or reptilian, or a lot of animal images that I try to mess around with. And then on top of that, to play with the language, the great language, the great words that the writers give me, and then the bonus of it being Southern is I can play with lilting and sliding up snake-like to you and then get you. Or I can go right for you, juggler, bum, 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 staccato-like, and it's really fast. So there's a lot of external things going on with playing the character and a lot of internal things like backstory, trying to figure out uh, you know, how he was as a child. There's one episode where, where Bellick says to me, I read your psych report, Teddy. You know, your daddy did his sister years ago and out popped Teddy. And that was a huge uh, key, a huge door opening for me to what kind of childhood this guy had to what made him become the way he is today. The two of you will never make it. Oh, Fish, it's not just two. It's very important that all the relationships, all the, the camaraderie between the characters, between the actors is great and that there's chemistry between these, these guys. And that's something that I can't create. That either exists or it doesn't exist. There's no, you know, doubt about it. Uh, chemistry is not something that I am creating. It's about, it's your choice of casting. And when you cast a show correctly and you stay true to who those characters are and you hire the best actors, you're just hoping for chemistry because if there's chemistry, then the show works on, on, in the way that, that, that Prison Break works on this level. Prison Break is very much an ensemble show. I don't think we have uh, anyone who I would classify as a lead or uh, as a supporting actor. Everyone brings something very integral and critical to the table. Yeah, everyone. Everyone has their, their, their strengths, you know what I mean? Everyone has their, their things that they're like really good at. and. and and uh, even when days come along and we, you know, feel a little insecure or feel a little bit weak or not really pulling or feel like we're not pulling our weight, we, we all help each other out. So, you know, we, we help each other get there. It's a beautiful thing. It's great being part of a, a great acting talent like this. Uh, you know you're in safe hands and, you know, it's, it's shown in the performances this year. I've always said that uh, you, you play with the best and your game becomes better, you know? It, it races to that level. Working with these guys it just makes me bring my A game. Every time you come into set, you see Robert Nepper, you see Wentworth, you see Dominic, you, you see Rockman. I mean, all these guys, they bring their A game and you have to bring their, your, your A game as well, otherwise you'll stay behind. Everyone brings something crucial to the table. Sucre brings uh, a little bit of comedy and Teabag brings a seductive kind of menace and Michael's there to move the plot along and Lincoln is the brooding hunk and we have such a great cast. It's really one of the strengths of the show. I, I just wake up going, hey, oh man, I have a scene with Teabag. Oh man, I have a scene with Sucre. Oh man, I have a scene, you know, with Westmoreland. It's just, it's one of those things where you get excited. 
about. You know, it's not just, oh, I gotta go work today. It's like, man, I, I have some things that I, I, you know, I can do. These are all fantastic character actors, all of whom have resumes as long as my arm. And uh, it's been a great learning experience for me personally, just to be able to stand across from one of these individuals in a scene and uh, watch them do what they do. It's been invaluable in that respect. This cast is uh, a blessing in that, um, you know, I'm working with actors that are uh, kind of brilliant. I had a teacher who always told me, steal from the best and make it your own. And basically that's what I'm doing. Joliet, you know, with its history, it was built in 1858 by the inmates from the local quarry. We went out and looked at it and fell in love with it immediately. We're very, very lucky to be shooting at an actual prison. It was shut down in 2002, but um, we have the run of the place, and Joliet has a 150-year history that's very rich and dark. A lot of men lived and died there, and it's the most important character on the show, I'd have to say. Wherever you point the camera, there's always something going on in the background. If it's the steam room, if it's the warden's offices, if it's the towers, there's always something going on. Working in the prison um, adds a lot of authenticity to the show, and in that way it's very filmic in its look, and, as a, you know, and it helps you actors. You don't feel like you're on a soundstage, because you're not, you know, and it, it brings the atmosphere to you, you know, Joliet's a very depressing kind of place. It's actually a shithole, you know, and I don't like it at all, and, and which, which serves the character well, and it serves all of us well. We didn't sleep in Chicago and shuttle every night to Joliet or every morning to Joliet. We stayed in Joliet, in that town. It's very helpful for the actors to be in an environment that is true to life. That has been the, one of the things that has not been the most um, uplifting because there's a lot of bad energy within the prison walls and you cannot help but to notice it or give it its respect. You know, there, there's been a lot of evil things there. So that whole pit is, you know, it stinks. Being in that town and being in, in a prison community, it's amazing because it makes you feel like you're really living it. It's a lot of atmosphere when you walk around all alone sometimes in the tears, and you can feel the tears, and no wonder they're called tears. It's pretty spooky, it is, but the walls are crying sometimes. You don't see ghosts, but, but, but any building that I've had 150 years of tormenting souls, you know, you can feel it. As soon as I put on my clothes and I walk out of my trailer and I walk through that gate and you see that massive gate welcoming you <laughs> to your home, you know you're, you're in it and you don't have to do any acting whatsoever. It is a little bit creepy. I've never had any supernatural experiences myself, but um, you feel like there is something in the air, something kind of oppressive. And uh, it does serve to remind you day in and day out of what the stakes are. Because some of our plot elements are so far-fetched and um, fantastic, it's critical that we have something like the prison to root us in a kind of reality. It just provides um, uh, a degree of authenticity and integrity that are essential to the show. I'm glad to break out soon because I feel like I've been in prison for nine months. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm not going to miss Joliet. I don't know, it's one of those things, it's like high school. Uh, you, you can't wait to leave, and then you go, you look back, you go, God, I miss it. So I don't know, I'll tell you when I get out. You want to know what the 90 grand was for? I think I do. You. The writers on the show are incredibly clever. It's one of our strengths. We have a team of writers led by Paul Schering and Matt Olmsted in Los Angeles who um, are just... Uh, extraordinarily sharp and creative. Working with the writers has been fantastic, you know, it's, it's, it's a dream to work with Paul and, and Matt and all the guys, you know, they really trust the actors and writers out there can take a leaf from Paul and Matt because we know what we're doing. They allow us to, you know, to add our own stuff to the words, we can change some stuff, it doesn't have to be locked in word word. When you get a writer who's like, you know what, I'm giving you good stuff, now you go and take it and make it yours. And it's like, okay, great, thank you for giving me some of the responsibility as an actor, you love that. I have to applaud the writers and the creative team because they have gone back and uh, explored the antique drama in Shakespeare, the old legends, and sort of woven all that into prison breakup today. Everyone has been very, very open and very, very, you know, hey, give us some ideas or, you know, um, 
hey, dude, I don't know how to talk black. So, you know, you take this line and you make it, you know, whatever it is that you need to do in order to make it grounded. And they've been so open and so beautiful, so wonderful. It's just like, there's no ego. I like to outlet once in a while and just bring some flavor to the, to the character. I see it's Puerto Rican. So they'll come up to me and they'll say, okay, how would you say this in Spanish? Or how would you say this in Spanish? It's the only input I've got. Believe me, they don't, they don't need anybody else. These guys are phenomenal. They're doing an amazing job. It's, it's a roller coaster. Every time we've done a script, people say, did you know what was coming up in the next episode? I said, no, I don't want to know. I'm kind of like the audience. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. You don't know what's going to happen in, in the next episode. Like a week from now, we don't know. We get the script maybe tomorrow, and you, okay. Oh, that's cool, that's cool. Once the script comes out, we're all fighting to see which one gets it first and reads it because they're coming up with stuff that you just are amazed by. I finish every script, and I think, God, the guys have boxed themselves into a corner. How could they possibly get out of the situation? And then the next script comes two weeks later, and they've come up with something that um, makes sense, but is also something you'd never have thought of on your own. It's always two steps forward and one step back, which I think is um, critical to the whole uh, Saturday morning serial cartoon nature of the show, where every uh, act and every episode is designed to be a kind of cliffhanger to keep you coming back for more. And in that, I think they're very successful. It all stems from the script. The story is what makes it so great. I have just helped bring that vision, which is Paul's vision, to the small screen. I'm just really impressed with their structure, their intelligence, the way they can map out a whole story and, and make everything match. You know, um, it's just, it's been a joy working with them. That'll be 300 bucks. <laughs>I think the reason Prison Break is successful is not just because we have a great cast and a great team of writers and a really great story, and I think we tell it well. It's also because uh, in addition to the romance and the suspense and the adventure and the bloodshed and the drama, it's essentially a story about family. And uh, as such, it has a base element to it that everyone, uh, no matter where they are, who they are, can uh, relate to. We have characters that you're willing to invest in long term. Prison Break is a show that is really showing the humanity in prison. That these are people, that's, yes they're criminals, but they're people. And that's why I'm really excited to be a part of it and I'm grateful uh, and uh, happy that uh, I was asked to uh, direct the pilot and uh, executive produce the show. Honestly, it's gonna sound cliche, but it's one of those things I can relate now when people say, oh, we have a family going on and it's really, we root for each other, we, we take care of each other and, and, and I'm very happy and blessed to be in this. To be in a TV show, it's hard. To be in a great TV show, that's, that's, that's like hitting the lotto. And I think I hit the lotto. I just want to say thank you to the people that have watched and supported this show. It's, it's an amazing feeling to, to be in something that people oh, instantly fuck. let you know on the streets how they feel. I just want to say hello to my fans out there and to my, my people back home in Sweden. If, you buy this. Mom and dad back in Sweden. Be well. <laughs> See you soon. Ciao. Season two is going to be a, a complete reinvention of Prison Break in, in the sense that if we were locked in a box and we had only that much range of motion for all our characters and we were able to, you know, tell that uh, dynamic of a story in season one, now we have the entire country and the entire world to tell these stories with these various characters. So it's going to be a hell of a ride with uh, just about anything you can possibly imagine going on. To all the Prison Break fans out there, if you love Prison Break and you love the first season, you're gonna flip over the second season. So keep watching and thanks for all your support and thanks for watching Prison Break. It's hard now to see it continue over the second season. What's gonna happen, you know, after we break out? Are we all gonna come back again and start anew? We don't know. Or maybe we'll all end up in prison in Mexico, then a prison maybe in on Hawaii. Maybe we do like a a prison break thing like a reality show the guys who breaks out from any prison in the world <laughs> put us in a prison in Russia we'll break out within the season we promise <laughs>